So uh, I have the privilege of leading a lot of teams and going to a lot of camps and working with a lot of people. And one way that uh, I get to know people is a game called Put a Finger Down. So here's what we're going to do for this first part of the message. This is the interactive portion, everybody. You can hate me later. I need everyone to put 10 fingers up, all 10 fingers up. If you have nine fingers, you lost one in an industrial accident. That's fine. That's fine. You're just already losing. That's all I've got to say right here, okay? All right, so if I say, I'm going to say something, and if you have done the thing, I'm going to say, put a finger down, and you're going to put a finger down if you've done it. Sound good? Pretty self-explanatory. For instance, if you are watching this online or listening to this right now, go ahead and put a finger down. All you guys, still 10 fingers. Good job. All right? Um, Put a finger down if your birthday's not in October. (laughs) Gotcha. All right? Put a finger down if you have ever called somebody the wrong name. Ooh. All right? I heard some pain there. There were some of you that have really called somebody the wrong name at times. Put a finger down if you've ever had a pet run away and lost that pet. Not just lost it to death, but like if you've ever had a pet run away from your house. Put a finger down if you dip your french fries in, fr- in your frosty, all right? I know there's some of you weirdos out there, all right? Put a finger down if you have ever won a championship in your sport. Maybe it's Little League. I don't care. If you've ever taken first place, put a finger down. Some of you are down to one hand already. You guys have lived, all right? Uh, Put a finger down if you carry cash with you. If you carry cash, okay. Put a finger down if you wear socks with sandals. Uh, Now you know. Now you know, people. Now you know. Put a finger down if you have an iPhone. Oh, you Android people are like, yeah, there they are. I knew you guys. I got you. Put a, fin- put a finger down if you live within 30, a 30 minute drive of your parents. If you still live within a 30 minute drive of your parents, put a finger down. If you have read more than 10 pages in a book this week, put a finger down. Put a finger down if you own a jean jacket, a jean jacket. Some of you are like, what is that? Uh, put a finger down if you are a parent. Put a finger down if you love the game of Monopoly. Oh, yeah. Some of you, you heard the disgust just ripple through the room right there. I mean, we're getting to know people today, okay? Put a finger down. Put a finger down. Are you ready? If you wear shorts when it's snowing outside. Yeah, there we go. Put a finger down if you had anything pumpkin spice this week. Okay, put a finger down if you have ever been hurt by somebody. Ooh, all right, who, who's out? Is there anybody who's just out? All of you like, yeah! I love playing this game. You, everyone can put their fingers down now. That concludes the interactive portion. If you want to check out at this point, you're more than welcome to. But I hope you don't because I think God has something really important to share with his church today. And, I, and I, I hope you can understand and I hope you, you recognize that this is a way that we get to know people. Have you ever tried to get to know somebody in a short period of time? You ask them questions, they ask you questions, and you kind of do this little dance. You start talking about the weather and see if there's anything interesting about them, right? And, and this idea of getting to know somebody... Um, is, is an art form. There are some people that are really good at it. There are some people who aren't really good at it. But if you ever want to really get to know the heart of a person, pray with them. Have you ever been around somebody who prays, who just has the gift of praying? Because I think a lot of times that's what we feel is like, well, I just don't have the gift of praying, right? And you've ever been around somebody who's prayed for you and you've, you've listened as they've prayed for you? It's impactful right? Now, I, I, anybody can pray. This, this message isn't necessarily about prayer today, but, but I think it is a, a powerful illustration of how we can get to know the heart of somebody, because prayer, what we feel is what prayer reveals, right? When we, when we start talking, when we start praying, it kind of reveals our heart, and if you really want to get to know the heart of somebody, pray with them. Uh, there's nothing wrong with written prayers. There's nothing wrong with prayers that are kind of pre-written and we recite. Um, You know, I think of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, right? Uh, I I think of prayers before bed. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. 
There's nothing wrong with these prayers. In fact, uh, for, as for my family, we've, uh, we recite a prayer each and every single morning as we walk out of the door for school. All right? Uh, Father, Son, here's our prayer for the porters. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for this day. Keep us healthy and strong as we work, learn, and play. May we bless God as we bless others too. May we bring glory and honor to you. Amen. And we sing it and we chant it and we have different people lead it. And as we're riding our bikes down uh, to Schultz Elementary School, oftentimes Brody's way ahead and Gage is way in the back and we're yelling it back and forth as we're driving or riding our bikes to school and praying. There's nothing wrong with these prayers. But if you ever want to get to know the heart of somebody, listen to them pray in a way that is not a recited prayer, because it reveals something about us. Matthew 12 says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's a statistic out there that many of you guys are aware of, that 50% of marriages end in divorce. And there's a, there's a, a marriage counseling company, and they've put together all these studies, and, and they, they discovered that if a couple goes to church together, that their likelihood of divorce is only 26% if they, if they go to church together. But there was one stat that jumped out above all others in this study, and that at one out of every 1,500 couples who pray together, out loud, who pray together, one out of every 1,500 couples get divorced. If they pray together, that's like 0.06%. Someone can check my math. I'm not sure. But that, that, that's, that's big. And why is that? It's because prayer brings unity, right? When you're praying, when you are hearing, it, it puts unity at the forefront. You, you, get, you get to put away the worldly distractions. It helps clarify vision, feelings. It helps us focus on what's important. It enables us to see the importance of our values, where our heart lies, necessary attributes that we're looking for in order to love and grow together, but also with God. And, and that's what this does. And so today, as we continue our, our study of the book of John, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to John chapter 17, where we are going to read a portion of a prayer that Jesus prays. This is, we're getting towards the end of John. Jesus' ministry is coming down to its final days here on earth. And John records this beautiful prayer. It's, some call it a, the high priestly prayer of Jesus. And it reveals something very deep about Jesus' character and about his heart to his disciples. It, it reveals what was on his heart and his mind in his last days here. And so today we're going to focus on just the last section. So we're going to be in uh, chapter 17 and we're going to start in verse 20. And here's what it says. This is Jesus. These are Jesus' words. I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one just as you and I are one, just as him and his father are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you, and, and may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Remember, John's chief objective in writing this down is so that you and I, the readers, would believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Messiah. Verse 22. I have given them the glory you gave me so they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want these whom you have given to me to be where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. O righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples you sent me, I have revealed you to them, and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them, and I will be in them. 
Did you know that Jesus prayed for you? Jesus prayed for me. This prayer, this high priestly prayer that Jesus was praying, he, he prayed for several different things. He starts off in verses 1 through 5 praying for himself. That God would glorify him so that he could return the glory back to God. And then in, in the second part of the prayer, 6 through 19, he prays for his disciples. Just imagine that. These are the 12 that were with him. Jesus prays for his disciples. He prays that God would protect them. He prayed for the people that he was responsible for. That unity and closeness with the Father that they would go out in the world and spread his love to the world. Just imagine that for a second. We're not going to focus on that, but just imagine. Jesus wasn't speaking English here, but they could feel, the, they could feel his heart. They could hear the inflection of his voice. When it cracked, when, when he was really meaningful, when he really got into it. The pauses speak volumes. His disciples heard him pray. They were hearing the heart of Jesus in his last days. And, and to conclude this prayer, he prays for us. He prays for all the believers that will ever exist after him. He prays for you and for me. If you call yourself a Christian today, Jesus prayed for you in this prayer. And Jesus reveals, his, this prayer of Jesus reveals his function on earth in front of them and that we get to experience today. To intercede for mankind. Emmanuel, God with us. God came down. His, his, his task was not yet complete when he prayed this, but he knew what was coming to intercede for us. And here we find Jesus in John chapter 17 interceding yet again for us through prayer. And he prays for something that's deep on his heart, and that is for unity for his followers. But there's a, there's a word that he uses here seven times during this prayer. And some of them we didn't read, but if you go back, and I want to encourage you, especially if you've never read this prayer, but even if you have read this prayer, I want to encourage you this week to live in John chapter 17. Read this prayer over and over again because in this first part, uh, there, there are several times that God mentions this word, uh, that Jesus prays the prayer and he mentions glory. He uses it in various different ways. In verse 1, he, he prays to receive glory from God, but also to give glory back to God, to mirror that glory back to God. In verse 4, Jesus requests, or Jesus bringing glory to the Father in heaven. In verse 5, he requests, requesting that God bring Jesus back to their shared glory. They had once experienced glory before the world was created. That glory, that closeness, and that togetherness that they were with, that he would be able to enter back into that shared glory. In verse 10, his disciples bringing glory to Jesus. And in verse 22, giving glory to all the believers. And then in verse 24, being with Jesus all of eternity, all the believers being with Jesus to see his glory. Jesus is shown to have glory on his heart in this prayer. And that, that Greek word of glory that he uses there is that honor, that renown, that, that divine quality that manifests God's splendor. There's a few things to note here about that word. That word is always used in the, in the positive. It's always used with good intentions. It's used for good. Uh, it, it's, it's associated with these characteristics that you and I would now call. So like think MVP or this person has championship qualities about them. Right? This is the glory that he's talking about. This characteristic, this essence. It's exercising our personal opinion or our personal excellence or our personal uh, free will to uplift God's character. It's his essence of who he is. So when Jesus prayed, God, give me your glory so I can return it back to you, he's saying, give me your essence, give me what you are like so I can honor you, so I can give it back to you. I remember whenever I was growing up, my, my grandma loved candles, and we'd often go into this uh, store called Yankee Candle. Anybody ever been there? Absolutely terrible. 
as a young kid, I would go in, and because the family would go, I was not old enough to stay outside yet at one of the many outlet malls that we frequented that had these, this establishment. And they, we would play a game, and me and my brother, first of all, there's just all the smells converging into one is just terrible. But we would play this game where we would go open the lid of the candle, shove it in somebody's face, and say, what do you smell? And see if we could guess the title of the candle. You ever done that? Most of them, uh, don't do it, Jerry, it's terrible. I, most of the time you guess wrong because, I mean, you might guess some, one of the ingredients a little right, but I remember, I remember vividly walking into one, opening the lid, smelling it, and knowing exactly what that smell was, fresh cut grass. They nailed it. <laughs> like, they, they got it. All, all the other ones, I could, they could be, they, oh, I guess I could see where you got that. But, but man, that fresh cut grass smell, man, it hit the essence of exactly what I remember, what I could tell from fresh cut grass. And nailed it perfectly. And the goal of that candle is to replace the fragrance in a positive way. And if you ever go into those candle stores, oftentimes we, we're full of situations where they miss the mark. Am I right? But when you find one that actually does what it's intended to do, it's impactful. That would be the bringing glory. It's bringing glory to that name. It's carrying on the essence. So Jesus prays for the entirety of Christianity to be united, in, united to one another and to himself, that his essence would be carried out into the world throughout the rest of time, that his scent, that his characteristics, that his being would be carried out among the believers, and that would be to be in unity with one another. Notice what he didn't pray for. Jesus didn't pray for believers to get their act together and become united in purpose, and then he would fill us, right? He promised to fill us, and therefore be united. See, he did not pray, he did not give us immunity from being disunited. Fun way to say it is up on the screen. Unity is not immunity. He didn't give us immunity from this strife that we're going to struggle with. What Jesus didn't pray for is, Holy Father, I pray that believers would never disagree. I pray that believers would never uh, have disopinions. I pray that believers would never get hurt with friendly fire. That's not what he prayed for. Have you ever considered how many games you would be undefeated if you got to pick eight people in this universe to be on your dodgeball team and you were facing teams of three-year-olds? Have you ever considered that? Some, thank you, thank you. A few of you I was worried about. I was like, they're my kind of people. How many, how many people, you could pick whoever you wanted. How many games do you think you could win if you were only facing three-year-olds in dodgeball with eight of the people of your choice? I got the privilege to, Steve, I told you I'd sit down, but I'm going to stand up for a second. I had a privilege this past weekend to teach at a family camp, to, to speak at a family camp. And one of the things, these families just get together and they hang out and they do all this fun stuff throughout the entire weekend and fall. And it kind of climaxes with this family dodge, or family dot dodgeball kickball game where it's kids versus adults. Anybody 14 and under is on the kids team. Everybody else is on the adult team. And guess who wins? The kids don't win. What is wrong with you guys? Oh, my goodness. The adults slaughter the kids. Like it, was, it, was a, it was crazy. The, kid, the adults just out there, they're out there to win, man. They're out there kicking home runs. And, and the kids don't know what to do. They're juking kids out. It's crazy. That team does not need to be united because they know that they have immunity from losing to those kids. <laughs> They've got three-year-old kids out there playing dodgeball, and they throw that ball hard at them. They're out. <laughs> Just imagine, though, if those kids actually did win. Not if the parents let them win, right? I think that's where a lot of us go. Not if the parents let them win, but how united would those kids have to be if they actually got all of their, got all of their team together and said, here's what we're going to do, and everyone took care of their assignments. That would, have to be some, that would have to be some unity. That's why we love Cinderella stories in sports. Because it unites the team. You see the team uniting under this unforeseeable obstacle, over this, this obstacle that can't be overcome. I'm going to sit down. 
You see them unite, and it's a beautiful thing. And that's what, that's what Jesus is praying for here, for us, for us believers. He's praying that we'd be united with one another. I pray that you will all be one just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, I am in you. And that they may be in us and the world will show them and the world will know and the world will see that you have sent me. I have given them, this is Jesus now, he has given them, he has given us his glory that God gave him so that they may be one as we are one. As believers, we are called to be one with one another just as Jesus and the Father are one and united. If we all agreed, there was no disagreement We'd have immunity from conflict. We'd have immunity from all of these things. And I feel like at Jesus, as Jesus' ministry is coming to an end, this was heavy on his heart, that he wanted those who call him their father, those who have accepted him in their life, those who follow him, he wanted us to be united with one another. Jesus didn't pray for believers to have immunity from disagreements. He did pray for believers in the midst of, of community to have that unity. We, have a, we did a sermon series a while back that was an absolute blessing because it was mass equals mess. The more people that we are around, the more mess that we find ourselves in. And that is true for within the church as well. United in purpose, unified in the character of God, that is what the character of God does. It brings us together. It is the glory. It is the essence. It is the character of who he is. It's the same character that God had with his son before the world began. He offers that same unity in the middle of the world of believers who are divided, who are hurt, who are frustrated, who are angry, who are publicly shaming and vilifying one another. It happens, it's being offered for that purpose, for you and for me. And he knew that we were incapable of this task, so he didn't assign it to us. God did not assign the task of unity to us. He assigned himself to us. He didn't say, we're responsible for the unity. He said, I'm responsible of giving you my presence. Therefore, my presence will bring unity with all the believers. See, disunity abounds in humanity. I think that's something that we shouldn't have to say a whole lot. We see it as a self-fulfilling prophecy. It is true. We can find things to be disunited about anything. It's natural for us. It's natural for us to be divided on, on all kinds of things, and sometimes those things are small, and sometimes those things are big, and I want to take a moment right here, and, and when we're talking about being disunited among believers, I'm not making all of these things small things. There are many of us in this room who have major hurts, major pains, and major problems with what is going on that cuts deep. The, the, but the issue is this prayer that Jesus prays, he's praying for us to be united in that. To be united, the purpose is unity so that the world might believe that the Father sent the Son, namely Jesus, who was the Son of God, to display that mutual love among Jesus' disciples, among his followers, so that they would know we're his followers, that their love for one another would show that they are following his teachings, they are following his commands, that what Jesus says is good, is good, and we agree on that. that. That we would receive the glory of God, that we would receive his essence, and that would be evident among the world. See, my capacity for unity is proportional to the Christian community in my life. I've talked with a lot of people who have been hurt within a Christian community, and they retreat from Christian community. They, they, they go away, and well, if I'm not around it, I can't get hurt again, or I'm not talking bad about them again, or I just need to retreat from it. Jesus wasn't speaking of institutional unity here. He wasn't speaking of one denomination or another denomination or one church or another church. He was speaking to the believers, to the individual, that individual responsibility 
that individual love and unity amongst believers. Unity doesn't mean agreement. It doesn't mean agreement in action or in, or in anything that we might think, oh, well, we have to be in agreement and support everything. No, no, no. That unity is to submit ourselves to his desires, to his character, to his love, to his law. He was praying that all true believers would be one in their love for one another, in their submission to authority of Scripture, and their commitment to the mission that God set before us. That is what unity is. You don't have to like what the other person did, what the other person said, or even necessarily be around that other person, but that unity and not allowing things to go come between us so that the world may see, so that we might give glory back to God. And see, he kind of ruined it here because he, he showed everybody the playbook. This is public, that the world is looking at those who call themselves Christians and saying, yeah, but they can't even get along. We're supposed to be united with one another, amongst one another. They will know you are Christians by your love for one another. See, the solution to the problem of unity among believers is not an artificial imposement of everybody get along. We're going to ignore the basis of unity, and we're just going to give off a facade that we're all united, that we all have this oneness. No, 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 no. It's much deeper than that. It's to promote a love for one another among genuine believers in the midst of disagreement. That we can agree on the things that are are there among other believers. We can agree on the things that God said. We can submit to authority. We can agree on the purpose, on the mission, on the vision of what God is calling us to do and allow our personal preferences to fall to the wayside. Notice that Jesus implied that he would indwell the believers as the Father indwelt him. I am in them and you are in me. God is, God's indwelling presence unites Christians in the body of Christ. So here's the question that we have to ask ourselves today. And there are some of you in this room and there are some of you watching online who, who are experiencing in the midst of this and there are some of you who have experienced this. But is there disunity abounding in, in your life? It's easy to sit here and say that, well, let's just be united. Well, let's just forget that. Well, well, if I just ignore it, it'll pretend like it's not there. That's not the glory that God wanted for us. That's not the prayer that he prayed for you and for me. It's easy to say, well, where disagreement is present, allow God's presence to be there more. (laughs) Right? That's easy. It's easy to say. It's not easy to do. Well, where strife abounds among believers, like, you know, just just let God be there. But if you really want to get to know the heart of somebody, what does your prayer life look like? I think today, some of us in this room, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. I think some of us in this room might be able to put a face to what is this disunity, somebody that, that you avoid on all costs, somebody that you actively, it, it brings up rage when you see this person's face, it brings up sadness, it brings up another believer. We're not just talking about the world, we're talking about other believers. And if you're not a believer here today, I'm so glad that you're here, because I, you, it's your responsibility. We're responsible to you to show you, to demonstrate to you what the oneness with Christ looks like. And I know far too often there have been people who have been hurt and been been, um, frustrated at what has happened in their life, and they allow it to overshadow their entire life. They change churches. They go out of their way to avoid people. They change relationship statuses. They shop at different places only because of this disunity that has allowed, they've allowed to fester in their life. So how can we be one with the Father as he was one with his Father? How can we be one with Jesus just as he was one with his Father? They weren't always in agreement. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, Dear God, I know the plan, but let this cup pass from me. I don't want this to happen. But he submitted, not my will, but your will be done. 
Jesus promises that he will not only be with us, right? At the end, he promised that I will be with you always till the end of the age. But in this prayer, he doesn't just stop at being with us. He promises to be in us and to fill us. How do we do this? Through prayer. We keep our hearts tender towards God's people by praying for and praying with one another. Because prayer brings truth and truth brings unity. We can pray for one another when the division, when division threatens God's people. Through the individual prayer of others, even those that we disagree with, God softens our hearts and gives us a renewed peace. And gives us a renewed patience. And gives us a new understanding. That his glory is present in our actions towards others. When this happens, we in turn give God the glory. We give God the reflection of who he is in our life. Just as Jesus prayed. In 17 chapter 1, or in chapter 17 verse 1. In this prayer where he prays to God. Where he prays for himself. He prays. A dangerous prayer. He prays a difficult prayer and he says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that he can give glory back to you. I wonder what would happen if we started praying for those that we see as different from us. For those that we see having disunity with. What would happen if we started praying that prayer? God, give me your presence. Give me your essence. Let me smell like you. Let me look like you. Let me act like you so that I can return that to you. Imagine how the church would change. Imagine how difficult things, imagine how problem people, imagine the the stain that the church has upon its reputation would change if you and me would stop living in disunity with one another Doesn't mean agreement, doesn't mean acceptance, doesn't mean we have to deal with on a regular basis or on an ongoing basis, but we allow God's holy presence, we allow God's glory to fill our lives, and in turn, the world would see his glory. This unity rests on the adherence of God's truth, reflecting the unity between the Father and the Son. And it furthermore is a union with the Father and the Son, so that he may be in us. God answered this prayer on the day of Pentecost that Greg talked about last week with the Holy Spirit, that that his spirit would infill us, that his spirit would be with us. What would it look like if we said, put a finger down if? Put a finger down if you've been hurt by somebody in the church. Put a finger down if, if you go out of your way to avoid somebody. Put a finger down if you've experienced church hurt. If you have anger towards another believer. If you avoid other believers when you see them, put a finger down. That's the hurt. That's the disunity that God is talking about. And it's not diminishing that. It's not saying it's not there. Pretend it never happened. Let's put up a facade. It's saying, my glory is greater than that. You don't have to be stuck in that. So here's what I'm going to challenge you to do. I'm going to ask the band to go ahead and come on up. I know I told you to come on up during prayer, but I want you to go ahead and come on up right now. And we're going to sing together, but I want to Take a moment and pray, because here's my challenge to you this week. If, if you have a name, if you have a face, if there is somebody in your life who calls themselves a believer, and it's easy to say, well, obviously they're not a believer because they have hurt me deeply, because, because there has been disunity, there has been a broken relationship in my life. If there is a name, if there is a face, if there is somebody there, here's my challenge to you this week. I dare you to pray the prayer Jesus prayed. God, give me your glory so I can give it back to you. God, give me your glory so I can give it back to you. Give me your presence. Give me your peace. Give me your forgiveness so I can reflect that back to you. I want to challenge you to pray for that person, that face that comes to mind. When you experience that hurt, I want you to pray for them every day. Not just, dear God, be with them. Dear God, be with me. I want you to write down in a journal. Remember, praying together brings truth and truth brings unity. If you are really going to allow God's glory to fill your life, and which as believers, that's what we're called to do in a world filled with disunity, allow God's glory to fill our lives. We need to be praying for those.